Okay. Before we start, how many people think they know how a microwave actually works out of curiosity? I believe I have some inkling. Okay, and how, how does uh, it? 90 seconds. <laughs> well said, sir. Oh, okay, yeah, but how does it actually work? If you take away all the little, like, the fancy buttons and you just had a switch that said on, off, what would you be turning on? The microwave. <laughs> So there's like the microwave without buttons. <laughs> the light switch. Alright, so, cool. so we cook it with what? Yeah, really electromagnetic old. radiation. Alright, how do you go about making electromagnetic radiation? Oh, it's probably try to start with electricity or magma. <laughs> 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 if you wanted to convert, okay, let's say for this unit, we have just a simple power cord you plug into your normal power supply, right? How do you go about converting that into microwave radiation? Pulses of current. Pulses of current? Okay, that's one idea. What is it? Anybody else? Anything else? Magic black boxes that do stuff for us. Yes. No. So, has anybody here heard of a vacuum tube magnetron? No, I have. You have. <laughs> What'd you think? <laughs> Alright, so. I got one more days. <laughs> I, I've not heard of it. <laughs> so, a vacuum tube magnetron is the reason your microwave works. And it's actually a really simple invention when you think about it and you look at it. But it's also something that you sit there and you realize that you would never, ever, ever have thought to do that in a million years. So, thankfully, somebody used it for microwave radar first. But what is a vacuum tube magnetron? Okay, so we've got our power supply coming in, right? Here's your cord, and you run into a little converter, and that's all, that's nice and good. And then you have a magnet, and then you have a vacuum tube, and then you have another magnet, and then fancy death rays shoot out. So, Archimedes Does was have right. Any idea why you might want a magnet before I tell you what's actually inside the mystical black box that is a vacuum tube? Because most foods are high in iron. Exactly. <laughs> 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 Alright, what if I told you that inside of this piece, which is your vacuum tube? Magnetron. If you cut it, I'm going to cut it this way first, okay? So we're looking at it from the side. I'm going to cut it this way first, okay? Does that make sense? You have something like this, where these are the copper walls. It don't look like my vacuum. Yes, I know. And this is a tungsten and thorium alloy, typically. So if anybody of you, any of you know anything about thorium, you might already guess at the point of this thing, but does anybody so, know anything good about thorium? What happens if you put a current through a thorium alloy? It's radioactive. And you put a voltage across it. It's radioactive, what? isn't it? Like it calls me all near. It shoots electrons. It bleeds electrons. It just cannot get rid of enough electrons if you put a voltage across it. All right. So what we do is we use our power supply to put a voltage between here, which I'm going to call our filament for want of a better word. So you have your central filament. And you put a voltage between your copper and the inner filament. So what would normally happen is that electrons shoot off in all directions, trying to get to this copper wall, right? Because that's what a current does. It goes out and it comes back, and right? Yeah. So, but that's not really useful. You don't get anything from that. So what they did is they put magnets here. So now, what do you think the magnets are used for? Yeah, to the electrons away from the filaments, uh, away from the copper walls. Yeah. So these magnetic fields look something like this. So if our filaments inside here 
the electrons, instead of going out in every direction, what happens is that they get coiled and bent. So they form a swirling mass in the center around the filament. That's still not very useful because now you just have a swirling, like, bee swarm cloud of electrons that you're not doing anything with. And if you, I don't know if you know anything about microwaves, but they normally produce a very, it's not a very, very, very discrete band of radiation, but it's pretty, it's pretty well defined. Okay? So how would you go about, how would you go about narrowing the spectrum of your radiation? You could, or if you take this and cut it this way now, <coughs> or you could build cavities into your copper. So the other name for this is a vacuum, vacuum cavity magnetron very specific type of magnetrons developed in England before World War II and then raked on it, and that's why microwaves proliferate, proliferated in the United States. So, from this angle, here's your filament, the electrons go out, and it's actually a neat little bit of engineering. What they've done here is that your electrons can only exist at very particular or yeah, the electromagnetic radiation can only exist at very particular uh, wave patterns inside these cavities, right? And what they've done is they've constructed it so that as your electrons swirl around and around and around and around, it's sort of like hitting the natural frequency of a swing. And it constantly increases and increases and increases and increases. And once it reaches a certain level, It comes out of your waveguide, which initially was just a short piece of metal tubing. Now they typically have ceramic joints in it. They can withstand a lot more heat, and they're a lot cheaper to make than the really expensive. It's beyond side the point. So your microwave radiation comes out and into your cavity, which we call a microwave oven. Right. So why isn't your whole microwave just made of glass? Because then I'd be microwaved. Yeah, because you need the microwave radiation to reflect inside the cavity, right? So it's made of material that allows the microwave radiation to form a standing wave inside the cavity. Okay. Is the cavity size built specifically for that as well? It's just a cavity. Okay. Like your well, like your your your, uh, your microwave radiation will automatically find a standing wave to fill the cavity. Oh. It doesn't matter how big, it just, yeah. Okay. No, the only part, the only part they use to control the initial spectrum, if you will, I really wish I had another word than that, spectrum of, the, of it coming out is how they actually engineer the magnetron. Okay. Okay. So, if you have a three-dimensional cavity, right, in cross-section, what typically happens with standing waves? What do you have if you have a standing wave? Nodes. You have nodes, exactly. So, I'm drawing a different color. And I'm not going to draw it in three dimensions because I don't relish the idea of trying to represent a three dimensional node. So, basically, if we just look at it in this plane, you're going to have something like this, right? You have the same thing in this direction, you have the same thing in this direction, which is why I don't relish drawing it. So. What's going to happen where, let's say, you place a food article here? Yes, a food article. Or it doesn't have to be a food article. It can be a CD if you want to arc it. But <laughs> what's going to happen here at the nodes, at the nodes versus the antinodes? My hot pocket will be cold on the inside. Depending on what model you have, yes. What's going to happen at the nodes compared to the antinodes? Anything? How about that? Is there going to be a difference? Yes. Yes, you yes. know it's going to be a difference. I wouldn't have asked the question, but there's going to be a difference. What would the difference be? I can't flip in my head which one's going to be a cold spot and which one's going to be a hot spot. But I want to say that the, the nodes are where it's going to be cold because there's nothing moving at that spot. 
it were antidotes. I don't, I don't know. The way this is. What is it moving? The way? Standing way. I'm sorry. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a perfect standing way, first of all. This is a really, yeah. It's not a perfect standing way. But okay. basically, at these points here, my thing has started not to write inside the races there. It's going to milk quicker, if I understand oh. properly. It's going to milk quicker at these points than over here. Now, why does it melt in the first place? You're shooting microwave radiation into something. Why should it cook at all? It's uh, changing the average kinetic energy physics. Yeah, I told you that already. That was okay. Oh, yeah. The, uh, I told you that, and then you explained it to me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so when you have an electromagnetic wave, I draw this right. You have absorption. Isn't it aimed at you? No, that's what you always think. That's what I thought, too, is that these functions based off absorption, they don't. They don't absorb the microwave radiation at all, really. What happens is that you have your electric and magnetic fields, right? And they oscillate yeah, yeah, yeah. and they change. And they oscillate and change. And what happens is that the water in your food, oh, what's special about water? water? It doesn't just boil. Why is it boil water? Got a strong nope. dipole. I was going to say, exactly. oh, yeah, okay. it's got a strong dipole moment that's going to consistently try to realign itself with your electromagnetic field, right? So you're basically so really you're twisting, moving the circles. Yeah, kinetic energy so it increases of the, water. the kinetic energy of the water, and then heats it, boils it away. Now, why does something like chicken, Jason, can answer this again? Why does something like chicken or beef cook better in a microwave than say rice when you're trying to reheat it with water? Have you ever noticed that? Like when you try to reheat rice, it's never really, really like the rice you first made at all. It's kind of terrible. But you can reheat things like beef and chicken and meat so much better. Why? Because of the like fat chains or something? Yeah, so what's special about fat? It's non-polar covalent. No, it has polar, they have polar side chains, yeah. and those are actually really important. It's the only reason yeah. it gets hot at all. It holds more water. Is water soluble? No, no. What about fat? What is fat at room temperature, most fat at room temperature, that water isn't? Solid. Yeah, it has a higher boiling point. So, yeah, it has a higher boiling point. Okay, so your fat can get a lot harder without boiling away as compared to your water. So it can actually cook your food better, which is why it's a better idea to reheat something like a hamburger than compared to, like I said, uh, Rice. Yeah, that's why rice just tastes terrible. Never gets, it never actually gets hot enough. It just it's vanishes. Like it puts a lot of butter on the rice. Yes. If you put butter on the rice, it will cook it better. That's not yeah. So if it's got fat in it. <laughs> butter isn't that fat. <laughs> so if it's got fat in it. David if it's got fat in it, it's going to inherently okay. cook better. Yeah. Now, why does the, like you said, why does the inside of your hot pocket sometimes end up cold when the outside is hot? Or the other way around. Why does the inside end up so much hotter than the outside? Nodes. Not convection. Okay, yeah. So, so there's a couple of things going on here. The first is that, yes, depending on where you place it in the microwave, but if, let's say you put it in exactly the center of the microwave and it's rotating, so it doesn't matter. What happens is that depending on where the water actually is in your food, that part's going to heat up quicker. Also, what do you know about shorter radiation as compared to long wave? What happens when it hits something? Yeah, shorter wave radiation is more likely to be deflected, or is it's less likely to go through as deep into the mic into the thing you're cooking. A longer wave penetrates more. Yeah, Beca it has to do with scattering. you want yeah the scattering, and you know how you like when you want a clear image of something, you have to make the wavelength smaller than the object, right? You know that sort of idea. Okay, well that's basically why, because if you don't, it doesn't you can't actually see it properly. The long, the long wavelength doesn't permit it. It's okay. the same idea. And that's why in industrial microwaves, you can actually, they make longer wave radiation. So it cooks your food better for the ones they use at the restaurants and stuff like that. Mm. So what about s'mores? All right, so we're gonna make s'mores today. And here's why we're gonna make s'mores today. Remember these nodes and anti-nodes? What is this distance here? We have the wavelength. Yeah. So if you can measure this distance, and let's say you happen to know the frequency, like is on the back of every model of microwave you ever buy. This one is 2.45 gigahertz, or 
2,450 megahertz. If you know this, you know your frequency, and you know your wavelength, all you have to do is double it. What can you find? Speed of light. Speed of light, right? All right, so let's have some fun.